Smith. Hi, Jules. Hi, Sam. Yeah. So, Shots Smith, I'm just well, in time. To... Camera today. Yes. Hi, Samet. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Shar. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm doing fine. Just uh, hiding in a cabin in the mountains somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I wish so, I could do that as well. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you're in your new beautiful home up there for the summer, right, Shar? Yeah, we're just in a, a little Airbnb up here, and then my house, I'll be able, my new house, I'll be able to move in in August in uh, oh. Littleton, Colorado. Oh, but yeah, I'm enjoying a little cabin up here. It's super, super teeny. Oh, yeah. But but the elk come right up to the front window. That's pretty fun. How nice. Oh, what a beautiful it, yeah, you know, and it's frustrating because I have all these brand new hummingbird feeders and they're hanging out there. But I hear the hummingbirds. They must be invisible because I can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> they're not coming to my hummingbirds feeders. <laughs> yeah, well, I bet it's a, uh, well, it's beautiful out there, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah. a lot of tourists. I'm in Estes Park. Okay. Yeah. So it's uh it I, this is why my dad hides out in his cabin because he's right the 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 tourists are whew, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> See, so it's so like bad. we need to keep it a secret when we come up to the mountains, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think TikTok site and Instagram, like it, it um, a lot of places in LA that I would go to, like hiking trails they'd be so empty for so long. And like, all of a sudden I'm like, why are there millions of people here? And, you know, obviously they're doing their um, photo shoots and everything. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, it's so hard to, you know, I, everything's being exposed online. Everyone's right, like, oh, right. this is a secret spot. Yeah. Now it's like, well, if you keep saying like, here's the secret spot, it's not so secret. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, Rocky Mountain National Park has instituted a new procedure, which I found pretty interesting. Um, they you have to register now in order to be admitted into the park i don't know sam if you've heard of that really um, i didn't know that wow yeah so you register for a time slot when you can come into the park with your vehicle hmm. isn't that isn't that crazy i mean i've never seen this before yeah but it's it's just so popular now so they have to kind of regulate the number of people coming into the park yeah it's the way <laughs> of the future you know yep fortunate. right <laughs> There's a lot of people on the planet and they all want to enjoy their piece of nature. Yeah, it's their peace great. and hopefully not destroy it. <laughs> right. But, yeah. but on a happy note. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a. Uh, so Devon um, or Devon, I, I'll probably try to pronounce her name in a fancy way. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever been to Colorado? You know what? Just for layovers just for layovers and I promise just those layovers like I was lightheaded over if you're there over an hour like because me coming from the midwest yeah I was lightheaded I had a layover from uh I was going to what was I going actually I was going to um Irvine California when I worked for Boost Mobile and I had a layover in Denver yeah huh. and just in that hour I was like oh wow <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah. That's kind of fascinating. It's hard to see the mountains from way out there and the boonies, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That Denver airport is is quite a, quite a bit out there. It's a mm -hmm. it takes like a what twenty minutes or a, to drive into town from the airport. Kind of. Oh, at least yeah, it's kind of. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a new. There's something. Um, they built several years ago it's called the uh, gaylord so it's kind of a rocky mm -hmm. mountain um, theme uh, uh, luxury resort that is the uh, close to dia so you could you kind of see you can see the mountains from that resort so that's kind of a fun place to go so next time mm -hmm. you're in a layover try to make it a, a night or two and stay at the gaylord <laughs> mm -hmm. you know what i wonder if that's like one they have in Tennessee, or it seemed like I've yes. seen one. I don't know if I was in, in Tennessee. Okay, yeah, when I was in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, Nashville. uh, I don't, I'm wondering what the theme is there. It's probably not a mountain theme, but it's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
I have to Google it. Every week I feel like Shah gives a, a new like place to go. Like the, when you told me about where you, where you were going, I'm like, oh my God, this place looks beautiful. And now we got another resort. Yeah, and- I'm, a, I'm a postcard. I'm a walking nomad. We love it. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I need to be better with my backgrounds though. Right now, I'm obviously not a good background. That's Red Rocks behind me on that image there though. I was wondering. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was wondering. <laughs> Yeah, also a beautiful place if you ever visit us. I love Colorado. I, I, I just, it's just minus the altitude though. It's it, but it's also like when you start drinking, that's when you start getting really lightheaded over there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Like, why am I wanting to like collapse? I've had one wine. What's going on? <laughs> Right. Yeah, tr- try living in Mexico half the year, then try coming here and then go visit your girlfriend's at Steamboat for a bachelorette party. Oh, wow. And uh, then you wake up in the morning after a couple glasses of wine and everyone's like, Shar, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, uh, a raging oh, no. headache. Oh, no. That won't go yeah. away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's difficult to go from sea level all the way up mm-hmm. to the mountains. <laughs> For yeah. sure, yeah. But would you have it any other way, though? I mean, the the variety of your landscapes and the different people you see. I mean, it's a, it's a good life. Yeah, it's yeah. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So I guess we'll get started. We're all we're all here, and I see whenever Sam starts sharing the screen, Devin, I know that's when Sam's like, "All right, let's get to it. Let's get started." <laughs> uh, so welcome. <laughs> everyone. Thank you all so much for being here on the People Strategy Forum. We are here every single week and our goal, our mission is really to bring a high value guest speaker that's going to give you a lot to work with, a lot to take away. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, it's we're here to engage, we're here to energize and elevate your employees and your company as well. So uh, as always, we have a wonderful guest speaker who I'll introduce to you in a moment, but I first want to introduce myself and the rest of our panel. So my name is Jules and I help to host uh, these sessions every week, but I also hang out in the chat. So if you have any questions at all throughout this session, anything for our speaker or any of our other panelists, uh, do write it into the chat, address it to everyone so that we can all see. Uh, Sometimes people do it to just the hosts and no one else gets to see the question. So put it out there for everyone to see and we'll get those questions answered. But if you are coming to us from a different platform, maybe uh, you're watching the live stream on Facebook or LinkedIn, still leave us your questions because we do we want to know everything um, and we will get to those after the session. Uh, and if you don't know, we are also a podcast now as well. We've expanded. This is becoming a full on show. So if you can't catch the replays, uh, you can't catch the live stream, you can always listen on the podcast as well. So uh, let's introduce you to everybody else here. So I'm not sure of how it how it might join on a little later, but we do have Shar and Shara is here every week showing up. Uh, She's a former HR professional turned entrepreneur. She's very experienced in running multiple businesses in uh, the areas of health. Uh, She's also a career coach. She's a consultant. So she's got a very busy schedule and uh, quite nomadic as well. If you were jumping on uh, before we got started, you know, she's in Colorado right now. Sometimes she's in Mexico. So if you ever need any expat advice, she's a good go-to person. Uh, yeah, also- it's an interesting experience trying to run companies when you're all over the place too. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure, especially like the rules and, and laws and time zones. There's there's a lot to work with, but you manage it pretty well, I think. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, We also have Samit here as well. And Samit is a people strategist. He's an HR expert. He has over 16 years of experience working with all kinds of companies and organizations. And his expertise really is uh, assessing what's going on in a company and helping them create a roadmap so that they can be more successful, more productive, and have happier employees. And we also have Sam. And Sam is the founder and CEO of Comp Team. Uh, He is a reward strategist, compensation expert. Uh, Very busy right now because compensation is a very hot topic, as we all know at the Mm -hmm. moment. And uh, not only does he run his own company, but he brings us the People Strategy Forum every week as well. 
So that is your uh, panel here. Let me introduce you to our lovely guest speaker, Devin Moody Graham. She is a very busy lady. So we're very grateful that she's found a little bit of time for us today, because not only is she a mother, but she's an internet, international business strategist, a speaker, a community leader, the chief solutions officer of CEO Mum Empire, and she has a community specifically for mothers, the CEO Mum Project. So that helps with, uh, mothers, especially to create and launch their own businesses. She has uh, been very busy traveling to Paris. She's got a trip to Paris next week, actually, she was just telling us about. And over the last 13 years, she's worked with over 500 businesses, 15,000 youth and adults in the areas of uh, professional leadership and entrepreneurship. So very busy. She has a lot of projects going on. Uh, we're very excited to welcome her. Thank you so much, Devin, for being here. And we cannot wait to uh, hear everything you have. Oh, by the way, the topic today is creating authentic business cultures that convert. So she's an expert with creating relationships and really setting the foundation. So again, thank you, Devin, so much for being here and welcome to the forum. Thank you for having me. So Devin, I know that, you, I mean, you, I mean, Jules just just to, totally was telling us about <laughs> how, how busy you are. I mean, it, it looks like you're, you're, you're doing a little bit of everything. And so tell us, tell us how you, you've come to this driven place of, of helping so many people. Well, you know what, um, it really, it started, um, I guess I would literally say it started before I was born. Um, I am the child product right of entrepreneurs so my dad has been a cobbler a shoe repairman for over 60 years and my mom a cosmetologist so i come from very creative people and uh growing up i was helping with the business i so i had been you know going to the supply store with him and my mom and writing checks and at that time of course as a young kid as i'm aging myself um he would do the merchant slips, you know, to kind of run the carbon copy over. So we're like tearing the slips off. And it was such a cool experience. So I literally grew up around business um, my entire life. Wow. And so I know how important small business is to the community and to the family. And what I was literally noticing, you know, as I went on through school and later in college, because I actually went in college English pre-law <laughs> and graduated with a degree in uh, consumer and textile marketing, which is like consumer behavior and retail marketing marketing. So I love fashion and I love people. And so it really enabled me to take like that marketing take on lit, re really listening to people and what they're saying before you create something for them. And I really, I took that um, along with just experience and started working with a lot of micro enterprises, really small businesses that were doing some things that are transactional, but they really wanted to create a solid business to support their families. So I taught myself a lot of things um, that I didn't learn, you know, in my formal education and really started to help people build good foundations so that they can grow and scale their businesses and have sustainable businesses. And from there, people started noticing, I started to teach more on the college level, facilitate a lot of programs for colleges and universities and entrepreneurship and speak a lot of places about the importance of it. And really going back to the foundation that um, business is about people. And yes, we, of course, start businesses to make money. But if you don't understand people, give people what they need. Of course, Sam, you know, they give them what they actually want, because it's not always money. You know, it's that respect, it's the culture, it's the, you know, the environment. And so um, I really honed in on learning as much as I can about that. And it's brought me to this place of hey, you know, as an entrepreneur, I want to do something different. And I just kind of said I was going to start doing business in Paris without knowing anybody there and started doing that, building relationships, because not everybody's going to take that leap, but it doesn't mean that they don't have the, they have something that people need, right? And so I started building relationships and helping people to understand that this is something you can duplicate in other countries and other cities. Once you, um, people start knowing, they know who you are, they like who, what you do, and you do what you say you're going to do, you can go really far in life. And so I really use those same core personal values and for my personal life and in business, and it's gotten me far. Wow, yes. So tell us a little bit. I mean, today our, our conversation today is going to be around uh, building those authentic cultures. So, um, you know, what does that mean and, and, and uh, how can we frame that for our listeners today? 
So you know what? So of course I didn't always, well, I did have a business since I was 10. I had a candy business, but that wasn't, you know, that couldn't pay the bills later, right? But so just going back to my experience in corporate, I worked with a lot of great companies, um, including, I think I was just talking about going to Irvine when I was working for Boost Mobile. So I would travel to California a lot when I worked for Boost Mobile and I was working in field marketing. So that's all relationships. That's, you know, hey, did you get my display up? Hi, how's everybody going? Here's some swag. You know, can you move my sign a little bit over? You know, can you move T-Mobile sign the other way and put mine here? You know, all those things happen in relationships. And so um, I really had a lot of both in the nonprofit space and in the business space of seeing how people wanted to be treated and I really feel that I'm a I'm, I'm pretty I listen a lot as much as I talk I listen like 10 times more so that's a lot of listening because I can't talk um, but really listening to people and listening to what they say that they want and they need in order to um, move forward has helped me to help businesses grow by telling them okay this is what your people really want in order to be more productive, in order to have the right business culture that they need. And even, of course, we're working with small businesses or working with solopreneurs. Um, they're working with contractors, but nobody wants to do even freelance or contract work with someone who is not listening to them and they don't feel like their work is valued. So really going back to the point of asking people what they need. Sometimes people don't know how to articulate that. So that is another problem. So that's a whole nother side. People don't know how to articulate what they want. But when people have told you what they need to actually grow, um, listening to them and actually helping to implement it and giving them ownership in it because everyone wants to feel included in things that affect them in their lives. So those are ways that I've um, been able to, to do that is those conversations, just the straight to it. Cause I, I'm a straight forward, direct type person, you know, in right. order to get results. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, relationships are super important, especially in uh, today's business world more than ever in the past. Uh, in, you know, in the, in the, in the old days, I guess we'd say there was a, the, there was a concern. It's like, Oh, well, I, re I really shouldn't be taking my personal life to, to work. But, but as uh, Summit would tell us all, uh, it's it's the age of bringing your whole self to the workplace, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, how can uh, entrepreneurs and, and business leaders create a, uh, an environment where people feel like they they can do that, bring have that safety to bring their their whole self to work? You know what? Um, what's so funny about like bringing your whole self to work? Just thinking about the big shift with people supporting women more because traditionally we know that um, when women decide to have families, they're the ones you know have to take months off of work. They feel as if um, they have to not maybe talk so much about family because they may be passed up for a promotion or maybe not consider having a family until they get the promotion they want. And that's a lot of pressure that men don't have to take on. They can have families because they're not the ones that have to, you know, take the take off. It doesn't physically affect their body. Well, I'll say that my husband says I made him get fat, but he, just because you ate my food, that's not my fault. You know, you ate the food that you brought for me, right? <laughs> but you don't have to physically, you know, take Love that it. on. Um, and so what I would say is when people are going throughout life, um, meeting them in a very human place on what do you need in order to not only do your job here better, but what do you need in order to have a better work-life balance so that, and I say that work-life balance because of the terminology, there really is no balance. This doesn't exist. Is this isn't this is made up? It's always going to be, you know, like this, and that's okay. Um, but knowing that people, if people are recognized and they show up because they like what they do, maybe meeting more regularly with them and talking conversations go a long way. And when you have that like open door policy or, or open email policy, or maybe if you're doing on chat, but people knowing that actually how they feel um, matters is important. Um, to them and people can use that both in business and um, with with their employees and their companies and really saying that and doing what they say they're going to do. Um, as I mentioned before, my business has been totally referral based because I do what I say I'm going to do. So as an employer, if you say that, hey, um, you know, I'll give you comp time. You came in early or you did this, you know, don't later say, no, I need you to stay the whole time. But 
I came in at this time and I completed all my tasks, then you're not doing what you said you were going to do. And then it makes that person, well, I'm never going to show up early to do anything. I'm going to barely get there, you know, when I need to, and I'm going to leave right when the cutoff is. And you don't even get that extra creativity, the extra heart or ownership, because now they don't trust you. And when employees don't trust an employer, they're literally only there for a paycheck. They're going to do the bare minimum and the company, you, everyone is going to suffer. They're going to get their paycheck and then soon they're going to figure out how to leave. So unless you can actually just those simple tools of, as my, my dad said, says, you only have your name, you know, that company name, the manager, you have your name and I'm not going to let anybody else mess it up. But so if I mess it up, that's on me, but I'm not going to let, you know, so I'm gonna make sure my actions line up with who I say I am and doing what I say I'm gonna do. So really taking it back to the foundations for even a 5,000 employee company or a three person company. Absolutely. And so, so as you mentioned, it, it's, it's good to have that, that good communication. It's, uh, it's important to have that trust and then also ensure people are accountable or, or give them a, a, a hold them to the, uh, the accountability of getting those things mm -hmm. done, right? Uh, now, Smith, I'd like to uh, just hear your thoughts on on uh, what creates that that uh, unique environment. So I've been, uh, so interesting that you speak of the whole self, Sam, because um, a, a couple of recent articles talk about do not bring your whole self to work. And uh, the idea being that um, my whole self could include my political beliefs, my religious beliefs. I could be, um, I could be very discriminatory and non-inclusive in uh, in my beliefs. So I cannot, or I could also be a big fan of uh, legalizing uh, marijuana and um, say narcotics being uh, legal at the workplace. But uh, mm -hmm. bringing all of that into the workplace is not a great idea. So. That's why uh, one of the points of view is that bring your best self to work, work um, mm -hmm. and bring the self, which is uh, which provides you with the psychological safety, which provides other people with the psychological safety to um, integrate well, uh, create that atmosphere of trust that we've been talking of and mm -hmm. uh, helps everyone in uh, getting the job done. Of course, I'm picking slightly extreme examples, but I mean, in a way, not bringing your whole self to work uh, does make sense in that context. And, I, I like that, Sumit, the, 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 the best self and not your yeah. whole self. <laughs> but, uh, you know, of course, it's, uh, I think that uh, there's an element of where we all need to uh, uh, really understand each other's perspectives. You know, it's like a, there's, it's good to have those diverse uh, conversations in the workplace uh, you know, can, is there a way to do that and have it done in a safe and professional way? I think that's an interesting question. And um, at least from an Indian perspective, uh, I can try answering that because we're, uh, as, a, as a society, we're a very uh, conservative one. Of course, uh, because of business reasons, the world has really opened up and that's why my personal self could be very different from my work self in the sense that mm -hmm. I might have uh, a very strong views about uh, various topics and even uh, like we've got uh, Pride Month going on. Uh, Indian society would have fairly strong views on that, but at the workplace, obviously, um, if you air those views, you'll be, people would look at you as if you're from uh, the Jurassic age and which is right. So, um, what I'm trying to say here is that um, I think it's an evolutionary journey and people need to be brought mm -hmm. up the curve in uh, in a slow and steady manner. Of course, um, a lot of things could be surprising or shocking for them. But um, mm -hmm. while some aspects should be zero tolerance, uh, there should also be concerted efforts to help people in being more inclusive because people do at least my belief is that most people would want to do the right thing. Uh, they would want to do what is just, what is inclusive, what is uh, what helps other people in the team uh, feel that sense of belonging as well. Just that we've mm -hmm. got to give them the right channels and give them the right education and, of course, uh, the right guardrails in terms of policies and 
um, compliance perspective as well. Great, thank you, Sumit. Now, the, the one thing, uh, Devin, I'd like to uh, understand a little bit more clearly when we're talking about um, you know, creating that authentic culture. I mean, do, does it start from really understanding what the, the, the overall company's core values are? I mean, is this where things start that we need to communicate this clearly? Where, where do you, what's the first step that you recommend to your clients? So definitely, um, I would say, yeah, it goes to the core values of that company because that's the only way you're gonna see if it's really a good fit for you um, as an employee, um, as a manager, is that as an employee, is there someone, some place that you want to grow, um, or is this, you know, maybe some place to get experience and then leave because ultimately your core values are not in alignment with the core values, and that's important. A lot of people say, okay, well, I'm just going to job to to get a check. I get that. I know we have to live. Uh, we definitely have to make money, especially now with gas prices. We need to make more money, um, but looking at long term, it's so important that we see how those core values of the company align and see if there's still humanness in there. We know that the goal is to make money. We know those things. But when you're thinking about what's going to meet, create a the longevity of an actual company, those we have to see, make a human part in there. We need, we see the core values. We know we need to meet the co the customer's needs. We know we need to be profitable at this rate. We know we need to be productive at this point. We know we need to, you know, do whatever those things are and those pillars are, but making sure that there is a level of, um, a high level of humanity, because as we're seeing now, people are leaving jobs left and right. They're leaving because there's still, you know, millions of jobs that become open um, because like, oh, I have options. So I don't have to sit miserably here. I can get my resume updated. You know, I can really, you know, get this experience and I can go to the next place that's really looking to invest. As we see more companies um, are becoming remote first companies, like more than any other time in the world, as we learn that what people say it couldn't be done, you know, companies I think about, and I'm not going to say the company's name because they are huge, but <laughs> my friend was working for a company and literally right before the world shut down, it was literally the first week in March of 2020. She was trying to, because she takes care of her aging parents. And so she often has to leave. And so she, what she does, she's always high productivity, never a problem with any of that. She knew other people were taking like two days to work at home. And, you know, so they were doing a hybrid. So she requested that and um, she wasn't able to get that. And they were like, well, you know, we can't send, you can't do this right now. Maybe we'll revisit it, you know, in a couple months to see if that works. And literally two weeks later, they were sending all the equipment home so that everybody could be remote. So it's like things, so many things that companies don't bend on are the things that they need to bend on in order to keep their employees happy because that's important to her. She she would have found a, she was looking for another position because it was like, I know people who, you know, I just like the company and my team, but I know people who are doing this hybrid. I have a great track record. I can find another job if you want to allow me to do this. My parents are aging. I take them to their appointments, you know, and in order for me to stop or changing my days, it would be better if I could do this because I'm always completing my work. I'm always dependable. So why not allow me to, you know, this is a big part of my life so she like I said she was going to leave but then two weeks later the world shut down and what they said couldn't happen for two days happened for they just went back into the office like three months ago yeah and it was so, so. funny you know uh, before the the pandemic as you mentioned I mean that working in a hybrid environment or working from home was something that you had to earn right you had to show mm -hmm. that or, or that you could be trusted and, and to earn that and then and of course that 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 was a real problem for a lot of companies when the pandemic came along because they weren't they weren't uh, uh, a lot of people didn't know how to be successful in that remote environment and they had to ramp up quickly and managers didn't know how to to uh, manage uh, people remotely effectively as well. But to your point, when we're talking about creating uh, authentic cultures, uh, uh, one thing that we've learned from uh, Brian Brown's uh, famous dialogues and uh, around vulnerability uh, is, you know, that leaders have to open themselves up and and to to live the culture, to live the values, and so forth. And so, uh, are there 
special ways that you guide your clients on, on how to do that in, in hybrid situations or in, re in remote environments? Yes, so I actually would take um, some things from like more salespeople. So I have a cousin who is an amazing, she's a, uh, I think a gemologist and she's been in sales like forever. She has a little black book. I mean, of course now people may have it in a, an organ in a, um, in their phones, but really taking the time to document um, people's birthdays, you know, if they have children, maybe their uh, children, if you've heard that, that their birthdays were coming up, you know, remembering their work anniversaries, um, things like that, that people know that, oh, I'm not just a number. I'm not just a person, a little notch on, um, you know, this slip that's doing, you know, this creating or being productive, but you actually know that I'm a person and I exist. So starting there by actually knowing what's going on with them. And it's like, oh, hey, yeah, I know, you know, Cindy, she, um, she has a birthday coming up. This is, are you going to do it? You know, how, how's she doing? How's everybody doing? And when people, when you ask about them, um, and even thinking about my mom who worked, um, she didn't work when I was in school. She didn't get a job until I was in college because she's about to lose her mind. I'm the baby. So she was stay home mom until I went off and her working in a store like that was near where my dad's shoe repair shop was. She knew people's kids names. You know, she knew what they were doing. They would bring her things back from trips because she actually cares. She's a people person. And when people know that you actually care what's going on with their lives outside of work, they're going to open up a little bit more to you, you know, so, um, and, it, and it may be literally, and this is very extreme, but it may even be a life or death situation where they need some help. And they now, you know, with mental health. Um, so, I mean, mental health has always been a thing. It's all, you know, with people saying, hey, I need to talk about this. How do I actually even get help for this? And once you're like, okay, I not only do I care about your productivity um, at work, I care that you're okay. I care that, you know, that you as a human, you as a person, are actually okay. And so starting with those conversations, document things about each person, not even each employee, about each person that's in your team, you know, like looking at them as people. And I promise they will give you more when you give them more. And you're not just acting like they're, you know, just only there to work and they don't have a life outside. That's right. I mean, you, you really can't fake caring right i mean you need to right. you, you know it's it's important it's, it can be a great tool to know a little bit about you know the the kids and, and birthdays and so forth but really having that authenticity about actually caring and reaching out and 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 having those uh, important conversations when uh, an illness occurs or there's a loss or things like this can be can um, gain a lot of trust and and uh, um, retain a lot of your employees uh, of course, it's and most importantly, have those great relationships. Develop those great relationships so that work is is a little bit more about life, right? <laughs> and and Shar, I know that you do this with your employees, and and you're very good at this. So, can you tell us uh, some pointers uh, for our listeners about uh, really understanding uh, what your people love and and care about? Oh, absolutely. I think that the. Uh... The last couple of years have really brought this this matter to light and really understanding your employees. It's it's far deeper than just knowing uh, how do you like to be recognized or you know what's your favorite snack so I can put it on your desk. I mean, I think that was kind of the old mindset about how you build relationships with your employees. Um, I think today it's it's a, de a deeper um, positive psychology aspect um, of really from a positive psychology perspective of really understanding what makes people tick. And that's some of the wording that we use with the TMA. Um, what are people's dreams? What's their ambitions? Uh, what worries, what keeps you up at night? I know those are cliche questions, but you know, I think as you mentioned, Devin, is that people are really worried. They're worried about their families. They're worried about their aging parents. They're worried about their college age students that are struggling with online courses or high school student or whatever age children. Um, and there's so much on, on employees' minds right now. And I think really learning how to have those crucial, open, honest, authentic dialogues with ways of tapping into those conversations um, and utilizing the various tools that we, we promote um, or, or other resources, just to have a, an open, honest dialogue with each other, um, I think is so critical. And I think 
it's a challenge for, I mean, I've had um, multiple managers and dire a director that works, two directors that work for my company and really focusing on their competencies and skill set to be able to create those real engaging, heartfelt, uh, caring um, dialogues. Um, it's not something that some of our leaders just wake up with. It's a real talent and ability to have that communication. Um, and so as an owner of a company, you have to really tap into that. And I have mentioned that um, I think that's what really attributed to my, uh, one of my organization's big successes is being able to do that. Um, but uh, switching gears, Devin, I, I do have a, I have a kind of a topic I'd like to ask you about. And it, I think you were saying this in the introduction, and I'm, I'm curious what your mindset is. You mentioned that you support minority business uh, owners, right? And um, I was listening to a podcast. Obviously, I guess I wouldn't declare myself as a minority. So so I, I'm, I'm curious what you think about this. But uh, um, I've, I've been hearing that, that small minority business owners really want to be supported by each other and held up and not be in such a competitive bureaucracy. Uh, let's, you know, one up one another. And I've been hearing that there is a, a dire need to support one another because walking into a company and just asking for an application and then getting the job next week is just not easy anymore, right? And the man and companies want to hire more diversity and, and companies want to hire the best talent, right? So, so what, are you, what are your thoughts about just overall the minority and business place and how the community can support one another for tremendous success? That, Shar, that is such a great topic because um, it's something that I talk about with, you know, my colleagues who are now, you know, more in director of VP positions now, but that was actually one of the reasons that I knew I wanted to work for myself full time because during the time, um, in my, you know, out of college, out of grad school, I wore my hair straight. Most of the times when I was in meetings, I was the only black person, only woman sometimes, and the youngest. So mm -hmm. it was all three. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I worked in the beer industry in my early 20s. So that's a very all white, uh, all male industry. The management, the uh, salespeople, the everyone. So I literally felt like um, sometimes uh, and there's an overall feeling that there is a token. There's a token mm -hmm. black person. So if you have one, then no, no, we're not getting two or three. No, we got one. So that's it, mm -hmm. you know? And so that is, and that has been, you know, in some companies that was really true. You know, it wasn't just talked about. It wasn't a rumor. It was the truth. And so as I went further in my community um, and in my business community and talking with my colleagues about things, I was ecstatic to do well once I started my own business because then I felt like that was something that I didn't have to work um will worry about um but they they do still worry about those things they has it has gotten better because most companies have like um a diversity and inclusion initiative that is not cookie cutter because they are being called out so don't just show me a video and say hey don't don't say that, don't do that. That's not diversity and inclusion. It's mm -hmm. really about understanding people's culture. It's about um, creating safe spaces for people to talk about things. It's about knowing that if your um, people should have been upset, but when things, certain things go on in the world, know that there is a uh, secondary trauma and it's very real that takes people to an emotional space. That if they don't call off, they come into work, please don't ask me why I'm crying at my desk. Please don't ask me, you know, don't, or don't act surprised. You can ask caringly, but it is a thing. Um, I have, um, I have a blended family. Um, my oldest son that I gave um, birth to, he is 17. Um, I had knowing that I had to give my son a talk um, in when he was nine about the police what not mm -hmm. to do when he's with his friends. Most of the time he's with me, but that's a conversation that um, people who are not um, black and brown people don't, don't have to have that conversation about not looking suspicious. When my son goes to the mall, I still worry. I have his location. Did you get to the mall? You know, did you all take book bags? Make sure you take your hood off. It's a whole thing. He's just going to hang out at the mall with friends and other people will never know how that feels. Um, 
I remember being so upset his phone died when he was away. Like there are things that in our personal lives that we bring to work because I'm I'm upset that your phone died. I bought you an extra battery. I need you to keep that charge because if you're gone and it's night nighttime and I just started letting him go out because he's 17 and he's doing a pandemic, he wasn't going anywhere. So now he's like, I've been in the house. I'm trying to get out, you know? And mm-hmm. so I am, my my senses, like my anxiety is heightened when he's not with me. Um, and those are things that people that don't have, if you don't have to go through that outside of just being um, afraid for your children, because all parents want their children to be safe, but there's an extra layer. So you have that living life, being a parent and all the extra anxiety um, in the workplace, in addition to can I actually get this position that I'm, you know, qualified for versus, okay, there's already one VP that is black or that is Hispanic. They're not going to let me get this position. That's a lot to think about. So well, really knowing I, that that yeah, I really appreciate your vulnerability, your authenticity, uh, open honesty. I, this is, I know, not the easiest talk, topic to talk about. And I mm-hmm. think that expanding the awareness and understanding. I totally Mm -hmm. agree with you. I mean, in my big healthcare systems, we had the quote, diversity and inclusion department. We had Mm -hmm. the, the, the video. Um, I, I believe me, I've, I've been there, but it never really helped us really appreciate how, you know, like you said, it's already hard enough to get a job. It's already hard enough to, to worry about that, but what's holding me back is I don't have my community and colleagues support to encourage me if I am a minority to to get into business. Um, Samit, I, were you going to mention something? I, I was thought you were you you're you're very knowledgeable about that topic too. So I think the one one thing that I just want to call out, uh, Devin mentioned this that that uh, yes, I mean, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, that it is a very important program for companies to have and and. And, and we've all seen the power of, of what a diverse workforce can bring as far as cohesiveness and, and uh, ingenuity and uh, productivity and, and, and a lot of things like that. So, but it shouldn't come at the sacrifice of, of, of uh, people getting together that have common experiences, whatever that might be, and sharing those experiences with one another and, and best practices on over how, how to overcome those challenges. And then bringing that awareness to the broader organization, I think that that uh, uh, that type of, I think that's a, a great example of an authentic culture. I mean, those that are allowing those conversations to take place, mm-hmm. and then also sharing those those uh, those great ideas to to make the overall workplace more cohesive. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Devin? I mean, is it is is it are you is those the type of programs that you're encouraging? Yes. So those employee engagement um, groups um, that are created, it's so important to not just create those so that people can share in a safe space, but also I think one thing may be missing, I don't know if companies are doing this yet, but having those people come together that have shared experiences, but also having at least, if not quarterly, a biannual time where those groups come and present and what they think people need to know, because you can't just, you know, huddle together and talk about it. You will, you you have to do that in order to feel better within the workplace, but you have to also present that to your colleagues and say, based on what, you know, we've seen, and this is something that we've been going through um, or seen in the workplace, these are some recommendations, and then let's talk about those together, and so it's really about, you know, first communicating and creating a space, but in order for it to really give the um, boost in productivity, the boost in uh, enhancement of authentic business culture, we have to share that information in a way that allows people to say, oh, okay, and ask those, I'm going to say those, as we say, those dumb questions, the dumb, I love the dumb questions. There's no dumb question, but you know, people don't, they're like, I don't, I don't want to ask this question. No, this is the place for you to ask so that you can understand and ask the questions that you don't know. And, and I'll take that back to even in, when I was in college, um, I'm from East St. Louis, Illinois, 99.9% black area right went to high school everything like there was one person um in my class that was white out of my total graduating class right so when i get to college i went to university of illinois urbana champaign that was totally different 
two percent minority out of forty thousand students of great university loved it um but when i get and i start becoming friends i made my very first white friend in college so guess what we were doing our 18 year old selves we sat there and asked all the questions that we wanted to ask you know, I asked about her hair. She asked about mine. She wanted to know, you know, well, how do you get that hair to stay in your head? So, oh, I glue it, you know, well, why do, why do you have to wash your hair every day? Oh, because it's oily. Like, those are questions that you can guess Google was, and Google wasn't a thing, you know, it wasn't there. I want to ask a live person and I want to understand because I care to understand. And so when you create those situations where people can ask those questions so that they can better digest it as a human, it creates better environments and everybody is better for it. So don't just create the groups, but allow the groups to present on what they think best practices should be moving forward to support them and make the overall business culture and company culture just better yeah that's a beautiful example example i love the hair example um, yeah <laughs> you know because you know i was on the opposite end that you know i spent most of my childhood in northern colorado and I, it's sad to say we had a big lack of diversity in northern colorado i mean going to high school you didn't see black and brown people at all and then mm -hmm. i relocated in my middle age years um oh not these middle age, but the school middle age, middle school years. And yeah. I actually ended up in a more of a diverse school. And um, it was really cool to see, uh, you know, diversity um, taking yeah. those student leadership positions, uh, being on the class council or the president of the school. And I was just, remember my eyes opened like, wow, you know, I've really been living in a bubble up here. Mm -hmm. You know, I had no idea until I started moving to more, like in the main Denver area to start being exposed to diversity. But I think sometimes we're afraid to ask those stupid questions because mm -hmm. we don't want to offend. We don't want to be offensive. Well, how do you do your hair? You know, we don't want to upset you because we've heard culturally, you're not supposed to talk about those topics. I guess that's sometimes what we hear, you know, mm -hmm. but, but if we create a safe environment where we can have those dialogues, I think it's beautiful. It's, it's great that you're setting that example and making those recommendations for cultures. I love it. I think that makes sense. Um, I know that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Please go ahead, Smith. Thank you. Um, I was saying, yeah, so that, uh, I mean, creating that sense of uh, safety where you're genuinely trying to learn about a culture or you're trying to learn about a community. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And uh, usually there's no offense that's uh, taken, especially if the question is asked in the right way. Uh, and I mean, I also get why people would shy away from asking certain questions because they feel they might offend the other person. Like I've been asked by um, people from uh, before Google existed or when Google was a new thing about whether my father is a snake charmer, whether we commute using elephants back in India. Um, so most of that's funny stuff. But uh, depending wow. on the context, depending on uh, what forum people are asking questions in and how the tone comes across, it could potentially also be an offensive question. So I think um, it's, it's, I mean, I'd probably prescribe uh, more of one-to-one -one conversations and saying, um, uh, and this is something I created in a diverse organization once, uh, the concept of culture buddies, where you pair up with a person, uh, you create that uh, sense of camaraderie between two people who can then ask each other questions to learn more about their culture. And gradually you can then bring in more people into the group and expand the circle. So it's, it functions like a circle of trust and you keep on widening it till it begins to cover the entire organization. That's a great idea. Uh, definitely Absolutely. having that, those opportunities. And so Devin, I mean, I, I know that uh, uh, you're definitely interested in the international environment and learning about new cultures and so forth. Have you seen, uh, uh, what, what kind of uh, perspectives can you share as far as I, I, I know you're coming up with that wonderful trip to uh, Paris here soon. So uh, what, are, what are some thoughts about in knowing more about those, those different cultures or how to enter in a situation that is completely foreign to you? 
You know what? So um, this was, it was definitely a great example of that. I remember when I was planning my first conference and when I, um, after making the connections and meeting people and like having her on my um, Instagram show to promote things that she was doing and just kind of creating that, add, adding value and creating um, that relationship with a few people. I remember she, her saying, um, you know, so what are the dates again? So I give her the dates and it's like, oh no, we're going to be on holiday during that time. So, you know, just knowing that hey, if I didn't know anybody and I was just kind of going it alone, knowing that, you know, I risk not even meeting the people that I'm trying to meet because um, every six weeks she's gone. Um, she's gone to the south of France or they're going on um, vacation or holiday with their families because they, they're going for two weeks and certain schools close down for two weeks every six weeks. And so just kind of knowing, understanding the culture and how that um, plays a part in wherever you wanting to do business internationally is so important. Knowing that um, you definitely can do a lot of research, but until you get to a place, it is, um, it's nothing like that experience, you know, taking all of that information that you've learned, because even reading, I mean, I would hear that, okay, the, the French are snobby, or this is that, you know, I've never had, in all my traveling, I've never had a bad um, uh, incident. You know, I've had, um, I've always come in with respect. Um, I'm learning French now, but I will always at least say bonjour, you know, always thanking, you know, always saying merci. Like if I even said those things, people knowing that you're attempting um, to at least try is is so important because it's about respect and going somewhere else and then willing, being willing to learn and to listen more than you speak. And so um, even as I remember, as I planned an event, at, coming from the U.S., I, I'm i buying uh, snacks. I go and I'm picking up still water. And then in my mind, I guess I do know that they drink sparkling water more, but I'm picking up because I'm just pick, I'm in the market and I'm picking up. And then so my colleague was like, you need to get some um, sparkling water, you know? And so, of course, leaving the event with most of the still water that I bought because most everybody drunk you know, the sparkling water. So just knowing different nuances about culture and things um, is so important and taking the time to learn. And I'm a lifelong learner. And so each experience is just me soaking in things, me teaching people things, we at exchanging information um, is so important in that. So I really have done a lot of that. Um, and I've met a lot of people in the expat community. So it's that whole thing of those people who have dual citizenship, both here and e either here in um, France or Canada and France, I've met both. And so it's like just knowing that um, how to talk to people who are is a, a native citizens of France and just learning. Like I said, when you are, um, you're teachable and you are a lifelong learner, you literally can be, um, a nomad like Shar, you know what I mean? Because you're soaking in all the culture, you're soaking in things and you're learning and you're growing and experiencing. And, and people respect others that love to experience their culture while learning about them. And I'm taking those same practices in business um, by showing this is how I can add value. This is how we can work together. These are our synergies and let's do it. And not ever making one person or one group of people feel like they don't have enough to contribute. It's like it's always mutually beneficial. And that's really how I continue to grow relationships and starting with places that I never, even, you know, in countries that I didn't even know by showing people that they have value. I have value and let's just add value together. Mm -hmm. You know, I, this makes me think uh, I'm on a lot of these uh, now that I have been immersed uh, living in different cultures for mm -hmm. six months at a time. Um, I've, I've, there's on social media, you know, those uh, social media where it says things like, um, like my, my personal experience, getting to know Puerto Vallarta or, or social mm -hmm. media groups for that community, which are designed for the tourists coming into the community. So they kind of understand it. And one of the common things I see is, you know, why isn't there more Walmarts here or, um, where, yeah, or, uh, why is it that, um, you know, the, the, the drivers, the Uber drivers, why don't they speak more English? Um, and, you know, I see a lot of negative reaction of saying, mm -hmm. if you want it here to be like there, then why did you leave there? <laughs> you know, yeah. if you wanted 
uh, Mexico to be a mini America, then why don't you just stay in America? (laughs) And um, so I have learned, I mean, even though I felt I was a very open diversity as far as inclusion kind of individual, I have learned, you're right. I mean, just a respect of trying to speak the language, Mm -hmm. even if you're kind of being choppy. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just a, just an appreciation, <laughs> you know, when you say gracias and, you know, an attempt to, to, in my mm-hmm. vocabulary is bad, but, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I have learned it's, it's very much appreciated and no, we don't have a lot of Asian restaurants down here. So quit asking where all the good Asian restaurants are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, so it's, and I was like, yeah, that's a good point. I should quit looking for Asian restaurants when they're not a ton. So it's very, I think immersing yeah. yourself in the culture. And I think it's so, I want to hear an update how your Paris trip goes when you get back. So we need to, Definitely. We need to connect, connect on our LinkedIn and, and tell me about your, your experience. <laughs> I That's definitely will. But it's, I think it's good. Those are some good, great pointers that uh, were brought up. I mean, making sure that uh, when you're going to a, a, a place where you haven't been before, do a little bit of research, some pre-work, uh, you know, make sure that uh, you take the, the a- a avenue of awareness around you and, and, and uh, have respect in those environments and, and, uh, uh, and patience, right? That's qu- quite important. Uh, well, I, I know that we're having a wonderful conversation right now, but I do want to acknowledge our sponsors right now. Uh, we were, we've been talking about the importance of, of having these, these dialogues and, and uh, learning about our people and, and understanding uh, what, their, what their desires are, their, their talents and so forth. And so we can, we, you know, communication is a big part of this uh, authentic culture piece. And so the TMA method allows for that. I mean, it's a it's a an assessment tool that you can give out to your your either your, your new candidates that are coming into the organization or your employees your current employees as as a and there's no right or wrong answer it's a, it's a it's all based on positive psychology so there's the important part is that it's a framework to have a dialogue a framework to get to know one another and uh, so the TMA brings a, a lot of these types of uh, tools into the marketplace and a lot of them are, are free. You can go out to uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, Apple Apple Store and there's and look up TMA there and you'll find some great tools that that uh, you can use for interviews and and also to uh, see the different types of, of competencies that people have. And so if you're learn if you're interested in learning more about the TMA method, please reach out to me and I'm happy to uh, give you one of those assessments to see what you think and and uh, uh, we love the tool. It's, it's it's helped a lot of businesses here. So. Uh, really appreciate that. Also, I want to bring awareness to our, our speaker next week, Chance Eaton. Talk is cheap and leadership is hard work, right? So <laughs> I think this comes along with the theme of what we're discussing about today. Uh, you, you need to, to walk the walk. And it's just not just communicating. You actually have to live those values. And so I'm looking forward to hearing about what Chance has to say next week on the People Strategy Forum. So as we uh, uh, wrap up here in the last few minutes, uh, I just want to encourage everybody to ans- ask any questions that they may have for Devin and so forth. But, but uh, as we uh, um, wait for questions that might come in, Devin, I'd lo- love to hear a little bit more about your practice and you know, how people can contact you for questions and the different programs that you have. Yes. So, um, well, people, I'm Devin Moody Graham, uh, dot com is my website and I am Devin Moody Graham on all platforms, um, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, and uh, Twitter as well. Um, what I would say about my practice, like I said, for so long, I have been referral based um, and moving more into scaling because I can't personally help every person, which I would love to do, but there's not enough hours in the day. And so, um, I work with people to help expand their businesses. Um, I still speak on the very startup tools and foundations, but really working with referral partners to make sure that those businesses get what they need to be sustainable. And then later they can come to me for growth and expansion. Um, And then for the next level of, if they have businesses, whether it's service-based or product-based that they wanna take international. And when I think about how I actually work with people, um, I work with people using a method, my three R method, when where I look at relationships, I look at resources and revenue. 
And like I said, revenue um, will come if you first build those great relationships, organic and intentional relationships that are mutually beneficial, um, that you are finding that you can add value to others. And when you have a value add mindset, things will continue to come to you and opportunities because you have added value and you've shown and done what you said that you want to do. Um, looking at the resources that are around you, um, things that people have that you need to create, but also looking at what's there because you don't want to recreate the wheel. If there's something there can, that can make your, your client, um, make them their, their workflow more efficient, more productive, out making those relationships work. So we look at those things um, to ultimately get to what we want is as a business owner is to make money. But like I said, if you have those uh, relationships down pack, those those things will come because you are actually executing what you say that you're going to do and you're adding value. And so many times people say, oh, well, you know, I, I want I want this partnership or I want this, you know, whatever this is, but what do you have? You know, we, we definitely know what to tell people what's in it for them, but how are you adding to them? So I really very much so work on the basis of relationships and adding value um, and those opportunities and provisions will come. Great. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, hearing all about uh, uh, your practice and, and, and creating those authentic cultures, Evan. Uh, so Jules, do we have any questions or anything that uh, 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 we would like to, to go through as we're closing here? Uh, nothing's come up, it's a little quiet. So again, if you have any questions, comments, drop them in there. Um, but Devin, do you wanna also give away like a best email or your website, a way that people can reach out to you after the session? Yes. So if they go to devinmoodygram.com, that's my name um, all together, um, they can visit there and schedule the time to talk if they're looking to expand their business, um, whether domestic or internationally. If they're needing more clarity um, around things, I actually do have a course um, that I'm about to release. Um, release uh, Exploring Pathways to International Business, how to take your business international in 90 days or less. And um, that will be dropping soon. So if you keep watching my website, you'll see that. And then also on social media, you'll be able to see um, that information because I'm really, um, I'm really excited about helping people to expand because I know it's a, it is not a lot of people know about the international space but over 95 percent of the world's customers are outside of the united states so yeah <laughs> that's a big space to uh, explore yeah good good statistic right. there very interesting yeah <laughs> that's right it's a big world out there we don't want to be staying in our own little neighborhood we need to be have some awareness right so that's great thank you so much Devin. and it's so exciting to hear that you have that uh that class coming out that that workshop because I know that there's many small, small businesses out there and mid-sized companies that are wondering how they can expand and uh, to, to uh, offer their services to a larger community. And so it's uh, great to know that you're having that come out. Perfect. Well, I just want to uh, say that uh, um, thank you once again for, for joining us here in the People's Strategy Forum. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Devin. Thank you for having me. All right. All right, everyone. Uh, we'll take care and we'll see you next year, uh, next week. I'm sorry, next week. <laughs> next guys, week. Not next year yet. <laughs> but, uh, all right. Take care, everyone. Right. Thanks, Devin. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Devin.